Good morning. Lord, we are bound to you. Thank you for meeting us here this morning. Help us to focus on you, to look into your face and rest in your gaze. Help us to preach your word. Amen. Well, there's a theme that's been running through my mind for the past probably two months while Peter's been preaching through Romans. And all this talk is going on of a tupas and a super Adam and my favorite, the hot mess um, that's in between the two me's and the two me's that stand on each side of that hot mess. The old man versus the new man. All these things kind of swirling around in my brain, and they brought me back to one of my favorite all-time movies. And I couldn't play the clip, unfortunately, but... (whistles) Wah, wah, wah. (laughs) You can hear it. Um, So, yeah, Facebook, don't shut me down for that, all right? That's uh, that's Ennio Morricone's property, and I appreciate that. I love him for it. This movie is a fantastic movie if you love 60s westerns, (laughs) where the lips don't exactly line up with what's being said. Um, <laughs> but the, the story of the good, the bad, and the ugly is it's, it's basically a bounty hunting scam that joins two guys, the good and the ugly, in an uneasy alliance against a third, who is the bad, in a race to find a fortune in, in gold that's buried in a remote cemetery. And so they're on a quest to find this grave. Each of them has a piece of information that will help them get there, but nobody has all the information. So they're working together to try to beat each other there to get the gold. Uh, One of the taglines for the movie in the 60s was, they formed an alliance of hate to steal a fortune in dead man's gold. And the movie is, is us watching them do what they have to do to get it, right? To get to the gold. So the, ex- the Ecstasy of Gold is a song that was actually written by Italian composer Ennio Morricone. And the scene in the movie that uses the Ecstasy of Gold is it's a picture of Tuco, who is the character who is the bad, running through the cemetery as he has found it finally. And he's running frantically searching for the grave that contains the gold. And, it, and it's just him running through rows of... Um, of graves, and the good is, is shooting a cannon at him. So <laughs> none of them are very good, by the way. Um, but just as a side note, just in case you watch it. Um, but it's the ecstasy that Tuco is filled with as he's running through those rows of graves looking for this, for this specific grave so that he can dig up the gold and have it all for himself that's important and that I want to focus on this morning. Um, Webster's Dictionary defines ecstasy as an overwhelming feeling of great happiness or joyful excitement. They also describe it as an emotional frenzy or trance-like state, originally one involving an experience of mystic self-transcendence. I might add to that definition that it's a, a state of worship. So let's talk about gold for a little bit. Gold in our world is, is a pretty interesting thing. I didn't really know much about it before I researched it for this. Unlike other metals that form in the Earth's crust, gold, scientists believe, comes from outer space. Stars are made mostly of helium and hydrogen, which provide light. Inside the star's core, nuclear fusion churns out energy, and as the star's life comes to an end, a massive stellar explosion occurs known as a supernova. That supernova blows stardust across the cosmos. Planets form from a swell of gas and dust called out, uh, cast out through space via a supernova. The gold particles were likely mixed up in the cosmic cloud that formed our Earth, our Earth here in our space and time. Fast forward a few billion years and, now, uh, and we now mine this precious metal to make jewelry, computer chips, false teeth, and more importantly, money. So basically, stardust is blasted here from a big bang, mixed into the dirt and rock around us, and we dig it out and worship it. The purification process for gold is very interesting. Gold scraps are placed in a crucible, which is a container that can withstand very high temperatures. This crucible is then placed in a furnace, which is heated up to almost 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Now that's a hot mess. 
But common use throughout human history for gold is coins. This is Marcus Aurelius. He was a Roman emperor. Roman emperors like to have their faces stamped on their currency. I'm lucky enough to have a, a connection at the Natural History Museum in town, and uh, we have a coin, a gold coin, that I can pass around for everyone to take a look at. So please be very careful with this. I've got to get this back to my friend, or I'm going to be in a heap of trouble. So Alan, if you would, let people take a look at that. Um, really, just please be careful with this for me. Uh, Marcus Aurelius is generally respected for his impartiality as a ruler. Prominent self-proclaimed atheist, neuroscientist, and philosopher Sam Harris loves to cite the wisdom of this Roman emperor. In one of his conversations with Jordan Peterson, Sam Harris talks about Marcus Aurelius' book, Meditations. He describes it as a near-perfect guide to the good life a book which contains just as much wisdom as the Bible with none of the barbarism. I find it curious that Sam and many others are willing to trust a Roman emperor who, by the way, believed that he was God. The term for that was Pontifex Maximus. It is commonly accepted that Marcus started writing his book of meditations during the, his war campaigns against the Germanic tribes. And those lasted from 166 AD to 180. That's 14 of his 20 years, or he ruled for two decades, roughly. He was at war for 14 of them. He was leading in the war from the front. In a, in a BBC history magazine, uh, Shushama Malik describes him this way. Marcus Aurelius may not have been a natural-born warrior, but the facts suggest that he was willing to lead his armies from the front and did so very successfully. Reminds me of one of our leaders, the stories of George Washington leading the Revolutionary Army from the front. As a matter of fact, he's, uh, I think he's on that coin. If I, if I could get that coin back for a second... I think George is on there, right? Alan, do you have that? What? The coin that I gave you? Do we know where it is? Oh. Um, well, if everyone could just kind of stay put for me for a second. I want to try to find this thing. I don't, I don't have enough to cover this <laughs> if it doesn't turn up. So any, any luck? It is. It's in Alan's pocket. Do you have it in your pocket? Is it in your pocket? Oh, there it is. Okay. How dare you. <laughs> oh, thank goodness. I don't know what I would have done if I, I hadn't got a hold of this again. <sighs> yeah, George is on the coin. It looks like we're not as far from the Roman Empire as we might think we are. Um, that's what an idol looks like by the way. Idols are very often made of gold. Moses had plenty of experience with this. He could tell you that worship basically equates to service. And this is gold in the form of an idol. And we, we can tend to serve it in our lives in this world, in this space and time. In Matthew 6, 24, Jesus warns us that we cannot serve both God and mammon. Mammon is often translated money, but I think there's a compelling argument that it's much more than that. I think mammon equates to the economies of our world, the economies on the earth, the economies of our space and time. And money, or gold, is what makes mammon go round. This is what fuels mammon. And it's only worth something because we believe it's worth something. In God's economy, this is fool's gold. It has no value. I'm going to call it dead man's gold for the rest of today's purposes. What if I told you you have access to dead man's gold or dead woman's gold? Would you be interested in doing what you needed to do to get it?
The scientific explanation of how gold got into our world is similar to the story of God sending out his Holy Spirit into our world. It's like God blasted himself out with creation and mixed in with the dirt and rocks of our world in our time and space. So let's take a look at the good, the bad, and the ugly of our journey of life from 1 Peter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. I think Peter just described the good in our world, the eternal life in us, the God in us, the Holy Spirit. That's true gold in God's economy. The new man, the living word flowing through us, Jesus, me serving God, me being tree-focused, as Peter would have said last week. So when I look at the tree and I focus on the tree, I see the two me's. We're part of something pretty spectacular in this realm, in our space and time. It's a journey of surrender, and I believe it's a lifelong journey for all of us because we are all going to <laughs> grow up and then pass away. It's just a simple fact of our world. In the words of one commentator, the salvation which God's elect receive is so full of glory and mysterious beauty that not only did the prophets of old search diligently, but even angels desire to look into. We live in a linear space-time to which God is not bound. It's different from heaven or being in his presence. Those in his presence are apparently curious about what's going on here. The main differentiator, as far as I can tell, seems to be suffering. We don't, we don't tend to get as excited about that. Um... Let me read on. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Yikes. I don't know how you're doing with that, but that used to stress me out a lot, um, a lot. Figuring out how I could be more holy, what it meant for me to be more holy. I think that section kind of describes or gives us a picture of the bad in our world, and that's death or my flesh or my ego. Us in us the impurities, fool's gold, dead man's gold, the old man, the flesh, our egos, Mises taking the wheel. This is when we're focused on us last week, and we see a split tree. 
We see a split tree and a split God, maybe, that we feel like we need saved from. So death is a reality in our realm. Dirt and rock does surround the gold here. We have to dig it out or burn it out or surrender to the process of it being burned out. Um, And everyone reaches that final point at the end of our journey, that final death where you're face to face with Jesus, the revelation of Jesus Christ. But we also get to experience it here, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, and Peter's been talking about it for 14 years. (laughs) Um, Holiness is not achieved by trying harder, though but through surrender. Surrender to death, surrender to life, and the process is a hot mess. It's like that cauldron of of fire that we saw. It's a journey. The process of learning to surrender to the good is messy. It's, as Peter called it last week, the hot mess in between death and eternal life. It's the refiner's fire. It's the birth process. If you've ever had the pleasure of seeing that. It's messy, and it's scary, and it's painful, but it's also beautiful. The traditional message that I would always hear was, do what you have to do to be holy. Don't be caught being unholy. You've got to do what you can do. Do it now. Be more holy. And I think what I, the message that I've encountered here with all of you has largely been surrender to God and be filled with holiness. See, you shall be holy for I am holy. I don't believe it's a threat. I believe it's an invitation and it's just a simple fact. We want to do this together as a community and that's that's why we're here as a family, as the little sanctuary and the big sanctuary. Well, let's get back to our text. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed for the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Well, back to our Roman emperor, Marcus Aurelius, is generally respected for his impartiality as a ruler we talked about. And Sam Harris and other atheists and philosophers see his meditations as a near-perfect guide on how to live the good life without the barbarism. Well, Aurelius developed a keen interest in Stoicism. And I just want to read to you a little bit about what Stoicism, where it comes from. Of the doctrines central to the Stoic worldview, perhaps the most important is the unwavering conviction that the world is organized in a rational and coherent way. More specifically, it's controlled and directed by an all-pervading force that the Stoics designated by the term logos, the term from which English logic and the suffix are derived, has a semantic range so broad as to be almost untranslatable. At a basic level, it designates rational, connected thought, whether envisioned as a characteristic, rationality, the ability to reason, or as the product of that characteristic, an intelligible utterance or a connected discourse. Logos operates both in individuals and in the universe as a whole. In individuals, it is the faculty of reason. On a cosmic level, it is the rational principle that governs the organization of the universe. But the Logos to Stoics is not simply an impersonal power that governs and directs the world. It's also an actual substance that pervades that world, not in a metaphorical sense, but in a form as concrete as oxygen or carbon. In its physical embodiment, the Logos exists to Stoics as pneuma, 
a substance imagined by the earliest Stoics as pure fire, and by Chrysippus as a mixture of fire and air. Sound familiar? I think, for me, I reached a point in my life where I realized we don't have all of the information that we need to process all of this. And and that was a good thing to me because without all the information, the Old Testament actions of God can appear to me to be nothing but barbarism. It's actually quite popular today to explain those actions away or to double down on them as evidence of God's wrath rather than wrestle with what they may actually mean. Well, back to our text, verse 22. Having purified your souls by, our, by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. I think this text gets to the purification of our souls, which is is a hot mess. It's not a singular event like it is for gold. So the analogy breaks down. God's refining fire burns our impurities away, but not by trying harder to love one another, by surrendering to love, to share it with one another. And I think that's the ugly, is the constant process of focus and surrender. Because you see, our focus drives our surrender. And our surrender drives our worship. When I focus on me, I see a divided God that I have to be saved from. I surrender to death. I surrender to dead man's gold. I worship mammon. That's getting easier and easier. When, When is the last time that this was not within reach of you, at hand. All of us have them right now. I'm on mine all the time. I apologize to Peter for that because I take notes on it. (laughs) But this doesn't go away from at hand very often, and this is a direct portal for the world to reach out to you and invite you to surrender to mammon. It's a constant reminder that mammon is there and it wants us, it wants us, it needs us, whether it's the news, social media, whatever it is. So we try to fill our tupos with power, control, security, survival, esteem, pleasure, all things of value in this economy, basically moved around with this. It's us running through the cemetery, frantically searching for dead man's gold. But when we focus on the tree, we can see a divided me. And we can see God. We can surrender to the Holy Spirit, to life itself. And we worship God. And our tupos is filled with the blood of Christ, with life itself. It's done for us, not by us. Poured into us, a vessel of mercy. So the purification of our souls through surrender to the Holy Spirit produces the fruit of the Spirit in us. And this was key to me because I've I've been told all along um, as I was a curious non-believer or angry at God or wherever I was that I just needed to try harder. I wasn't loving enough. I wasn't joyful enough. I wasn't good enough. I wasn't faithful enough. Um, and if I just tried harder, I could, I could do all those things. But I think those things show up as a gift, not as something that I can purchase with 
this coin or that I can pluck from a tree, if you will. But I think that purification process as we surrender to the Lord is God's refining fire burning away our impurities. And we find when we do that, that love replaces hate. We find that joy replaces despair. Peace replaces conflict. Patience replaces impatience. Kindness replaces meanness, if that's a word. Goodness replaces wickedness. Faithfulness replaces unfaithfulness, or a synonym, inaccuracy. Gentleness replaces brutality. Self-control replaces indiscipline, lack of discipline. Paul tells us that against such things there is no law. God reassures us of that by telling us, you shall be holy, for I am holy. The life is in the blood and looks like the fruit of the Spirit in our space and time, in our realm. A tree can't control the production of fruit that comes through it. A woman cannot control the birth process. It happens to her, and she can only submit to it. Messy, painful, full of hope, and beautiful. You see, surrender to God in this world makes a hopeful it makes a hopeful process that replaces a hopeless process. And ugly is replaced by beauty. And I didn't write it down because I didn't want to say it, but I'm going to say it anyway. It's more the bold and the beautiful than the good, the bad, and the ugly. Whatever you think of that. Um, <laughs> um, con- continually resist the ecstasy of dead man's gold and the death that comes with it. Surrender to the ecstasy of true gold. Surrender to the Holy Spirit. Be born again and again in the hot mess. Let God fill your tupos with his liquid gold. There's a more beautiful story flowing at hand in our world that we can't see, but we are invited to take part in it. Focus on that. Let it drive you. Rise from the dead with Jesus and truly live. And so, on that day, at dinner, Jesus took the bread and broke it, saying, this is my body broken for you. Eat of it in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he took the cup and said, This is the new covenant in my blood poured out for you. Take and drink, all of you. And so I invite you to the table to do just that. I have to ask your forgiveness. I lied to you about this coin being from the Natural History Museum. But I didn't lie to you about it being virtually worthless in God's economy. (laughs) And the judgment of God is that each of us would die with Christ and rise with Christ. That judgment has never changed, and it is good news. It is the gospel. In the words of the Apostle Peter, This word is the good news that was preached to you. You see, you are the gold, and the face of Jesus is on you. So by way of benediction, focus on the tree. Surrender to the eternal life that surrounds you. It's at hand. Be a vessel of mercy driven by the Spirit. And in Peter Hyatt's words, in Jesus' name. Believe the gospel. Amen. Amen.